Pour écouter cette session en français, veuillez cliquer en bas de votre écran sur l'onglet Interprétation et sélectionnez le drapeau français. Hello, bonjour. Barry Saleo. On behalf of Ikle Africa, the African Center for Cities, our future cities, Red Cross Crescent Climate Center, and partners, we're excited to welcome all of you to the Rise Africa 2022 Action Festival. Rise Africa has been growing since 2020 as a platform for thinkers, doers, and enablers committed to inspiring action for sustainable cities. This year's theme is creativity. For me, this means blending skills to be able to communicate the climate change complexity in rapidly urbanizing cities. We are walking dynamites of creative expression, whether it be in the arts, in the sciences, or in tech. There are so many people in the African continent who have a huge skill base and are creative in the way they approach challenges. Creativity in Africa is about embracing our host. It's about dynamism and it's about embracing our indigenous knowledge. I think agency is finding ways of giving power back to people, to groups, to young people, especially on a continent where it's a very young population. One should be taking ownership and the responsibility to create an Africa that they would like to live in as well as leave behind for the future generations. I think what agency means to me is change. From, from the ground up. The importance of urgency is the recognition of the past and the recognition that we've lost time. Urgency is about acting now to build more inclusive, productive and resilient cities. There's this need to creatively redesign and unlearn and explore new ways of thinking. The festival is hosting 33 sessions with 135 provocateurs from across Africa and the world. Every session aims to show new ideas, showcase ongoing actions, and launch new initiatives, bringing participants together to chart a new route forward. We hope that the festival program will inspire you. At the festival, we encourage you to showcase your business and projects, while lasting partnerships unleash your creative potential. Commit to sustainable action. Rise Africa is about translating ideas into action. What actions are you going to commit to this festival? Before the session begins, it is important to note that you're being recorded. And by participating, you are given the consent to be recorded. All recordings will be available on the program page after the festival. Creative expression is vital for creating new futures for our cities. And so we invite you to enter this session in the spirit of creativity and dreaming. L'Afrique L'Afrique est fatiguée de se retrouver dans l'obscurité. Elle est fatiguée de naviguer contre les courants de l'industrialisation. L'Afrique me dit qu'elle est fatiguée de se reposer au feu du bois. Il est donc temps de faire sauter le compteur. Éclairons l'Afrique, libérons son énergie pour libérer son potentiel. Accélérons le rythme cardiaque de son développement. Libérons son énergie pour libérer son potentiel. Transformons l'enveloppe énergétique de l'Afrique pour stimuler son développement. Car la nature nous a tellement gratifié de ses richesses. Changeons l'histoire, éclairons l'Afrique. Donnez un bout de lumière à chaque foyer en Afrique est une possibilité. Changeons l'histoire, éclairons l'Afrique. Libérons son énergie pour libérer son potentiel. Video that uh, could uh, provide an overview of what today's event is all going to be all about. Um, I don't need to say much. Um, we are actually celebrating urban development. Um, we are also celebrating the kind of progress we've achieved. Um, we're celebrating people who I call in my own words, urban legends, um, who are actually pushing the boundaries of urban development in their various own respect, um, in their own context. Um, and for that reason, we try to bring them onto this particular platform to try and share some of their experience and knowledge in terms of crafting and shaping urban uh, and sustainable development within their own spaces. Um, 
Again, I'm going to introduce myself. I realize that the numbers are increasing. Uh, my name is Kweku Krantin. I'm a professional officer at ICLE Africa under the Climate Change and Energy Resilience Workstream. And I will be your moderator for today's session. Uh, because there are well, and then the, the number of the speakers we've actually outlined or selected for today's session are actually going to do most of the talking and I will only just be chipping in from now and then I don't want to take the excitement from today's session. But today's session is the background of the session is actually premised on the idea that we have a lot of disconnection between science policy and practice. And when we say science, we mean academic research. I mean, if you are a school, any, if you're a student of, of urban development, one of the major things that we study, we often don't find them on, 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 on the ground. I mean, you go through our cities and what you totally see is the opposite of what we actually study in school. And one of the fundamental challenges, how can we actually drive or how can we bring science to policy how can we bring how can we enable science to actually impact um, some of these design processes some of these city planning um, policies that are dominating our city so again you look at urban um, spaces it's often devoid of that kind of um, insights um, context relevant uh, planning uh, that brings people and brings prosperity to cities so that this, as a result of these particular disconnections, we are trying to assemble people who have been working in different domains and different spaces, trying to shape the discussion and the discourse on urban development. Um, I am fortunate enough to have worked with these two speakers in different domains. Um, I started working with SDI in 2016. I happened to also join a research mentorship program in 2018 and happened to work with uh, Professor um, Schweib uh, from Makerere University. Um, I work with SDI from 2016 all the way to 2020. So I have a very intimate knowledge of the work they've done in the past. And for that reason, I am super excited to bring them on today's Rise Africa session as my urban legends to actually share their experiences with regards to um, crafting um, um, sustainable urban development approaches that can actually help us um, understand um, um, urban development and how sustainable it can be. Um, so without much ado, I mean, I wouldn't, I would love to introduce them, but I think the portfolios are too big for me to go through their entire um, uh, work experiences. So I would let them introduce themselves and we'll take it from there. Um, today's session, we are not going to have any PowerPoint presentation. It's going to be a very interactive session. And what we'll do is that we'll encourage all participants to pose their various questions in the chat box. And we'll try as much as possible to mediate and moderate those kind of questions and share it with our panel for them to give us their reflection and their feedback on that. The fundamental question is, why is it that there's so much research happening in urban spaces yet? we are not seeing a commensurating development impact. And uh, what is the disconnection? And whilst we are we were actually crafting this particular session, we tried as much as possible to bring in policymakers to also balance the equation. So the conversation will be just about academics and community or society uh, practice, but again, to also allow policymakers to um, share their, their challenges and, and, and that they have with possibly maybe communities or community, uh, 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 practitioners and also with academics in terms of why is it so difficult for policymakers to unload or bring on board academic research into designing their policy processes. And as you are aware, we are we're unfortunate to actually manage that um, um, process in terms of bringing them on board. So what I would do is I will let Professor Shripe introduce himself and we will continue with uh, Dr. Betty um, from SDI to also introduce herself. So please take over from me, sir. Thank, thank you very much, Kweku, um, for the opportunity. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you, Beth, also to be part of, uh, um, to co-participate in this panel with you. And hi, everyone. My name is Shwaib Luasa. And um, um, for a long time, uh, Prof, we can hear you. Um, oh, really? Hello? 
Do we I can have... hear you, so yes. Do you hear me now? I can hear you from my hand, Prof, but if you can just project a little more. Okay. But you can you hear him? Wonderful. Um, thank you can you. hear him. So the problem could be coming from our side. Kweku, do you hear me? Ah, he's okay. okay. All, most of others are indicating that they hear me well. Wait. Um, please go ahead, Prof. Uh, okay. will start himself out. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you once again. And great to be here. I'm very pleased to be here to share my own journey and experiences through that journey. Shoy Brosa is my name. And I worked for a long time in the Makerere University as an academic in the field of urban development, urban planning. And along the way, I've also participated quite a lot in micro level studies and participatory research, transdisciplinary research, and also at global level with assessments, including IPCC. So I, I have background training in geography and spatial planning and technologies, geospatial technologies, but I also found myself so much engaged in topics that would one, one would think of as falling outside the realm of my field of training in terms of, about political economy and politics and policy because of my engagement at local level with trans, transdisciplinary research to not just make the academy relevant and beneficial to society, but to really see transformation happening. And it feels a little bit frustrating on my part individually to see that there's a lot of been there's a lot of programming that has been going around for a long time, but the impact is not felt, or if it is, it doesn't match the speed of at which population is growing in these cities that I've worked in. So that's my background, and I look forward to engaging in this subject with all of you. Back to you, Rico. Perfect. Thank you so much. And sorry for the technical uh, issue. I think it was coming from my side. Uh, maybe my, my, my microphones were a bit cold. Um, so, uh, Betty, Beth, please, uh, can you take over from Prof and introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone in Kweku and Tribe. It's good to see you again after just three days. <laughs> so, so um, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be part of uh, this conversation. Um, my name is Beth Chitekwebiti. I'm Zimbabwean, living in Cape Town, South Africa, and working for Slum Dwellers International in its secretariat. I trained as a town planner and uh, was in the second cohort of uh, planners that we um, trained at the local university in Zimbabwe after independence. And uh, if you were to ask me about uh, uh, Maynard Keynes, if you were to ask me about the Green City Movement, I could tell you a lot. But I was never taught that there were informal settlements in my city. I was never taught that uh, there was an apartheid of uh, uh, the city, even in the one that I lived in. Um, so I have, over the years that I've been part of the SDI network, have had to unlearn a lot of what I was taught formally. And hopefully in the process, I've also supported others to unlearn certain things that are assumed as knowledge and as shaping what is required to make our cities work. So my reflections in this conversation will really be about how the SDI network has developed a process of knowledge generation that links to academia as well as practitioners in our cities to try and imagine a different kind of city. But thank you for having me. 
Thank you so much for that um, colorful introduction. And I think um, I'm already excited to hear more of the work you've done with SDI. And why is it that SDI presents such an interesting template for um, urban um, development and reform? Um, thanks so much, Shwai. I believe you also bring in your expertise all the way from IPCC um, um, to, to, to our conversation, trying to help us understand what is happening on the global level and how we can actually catalyze that kind of momentum and energy with regards to the climate emergency to be able to transform our cities. So without much ado, again, for those who are joining us, today's session is actually on sustainable development research that matters. Um, even though we are actually celebrating Africa and celebrating um, urban action, um, we are focused on the creativity of, of agency and the agency. And these are all critical themes that we are exploring within the RISE Africa session um, within these three days, starting from the 23rd to 25th of May. And going back to the theme that we are, we are discussing this to in, in, in this particular session, we are trying to, we are talking about crafting new approaches um, to uptake by local government and local actors. What are the new ways we can think about urban research? And how do we think about urban research? How do we bring in the various entities and agencies um, to be able to craft the kind of research that reflects not just um, a funder's requirement? Often than not, we know that research um, agendas have often been funded or set by funders with very little input from local communities. And I guess that is the reason why I'm super excited. Bringing um, a community actor or com an organization that is on the ground advocating for community voices in some of these processes. And I'm also super excited to also have someone from the academic space championing and shaping these particular research discussions. And I think I'll give the floor again to Professor Schreib to give us his reflection on the subject and how we can actually proceed and think how he should sow the seed of curiosity to set us alight so that we can begin thinking about urban research differently in a more creative way, in the kind of Agents, agencies that we can actually explore and the agency that is required to actually craft um, urban research that actually matters within the African space. So, Prof, over to you. Great, thanks once again. Um, I, I, I'm torn in between telling my own personal journey uh, and on the other side also striking straight to the topic of discussion around creativity agency and urgency about research that matters. But uh, allow me to weave my journey into what I want to strike straight to as research that matters for me, from my own experience. And I will start off by saying that as an undergraduate, I did um, a honors dissertation and that dissertation was how on housing problems and needs in Kampala. And I focused on a settlement which was Islam or infamous settlement. The model and the, the, the theory behind that topic and the whole framing of the study was about what is missing in the city. So it is the, it's what I call the deficit model. It was to do with the size of the housing, the, um, the metric or the benchmark of which was provided by UN in respect what, to what is considered to be the minimum floor area, a number of rooms required by how many number of people. And the other issues were to do with sanitation, um, which type of sanitation was in the house or associated with the house, connectivity to utilities, the issue of ventilation, the materials from floor, walls and roof or roofs of the different houses. Now, that was the package that I was given that I was trained as an urban geographer because housing was a very important topic in urban geography, including planning in there. Introduced, I was introduced to planning, 
I was introduced to planning standards at undergraduate. I was introduced to standards, standards in urban and housing. What I was not told that the framing of all those different standards upon which I measured the deficit within my own city were completely coming from elsewhere and were posed as or projected as universal, but it did, it did not mean that universalization of these standards actually was the case across board. And, and then at the same time, I did not reflect on my own self because having been born and you know, grown up very close to a slum area where I had lots of friends and almost on daily basis interacting with different people and seeing the deficit in this slum, including my own house or our own home, I did not reflect on the standards which I was given as a trainee at undergraduate level. But along the way, as I progressed into my studies and got into the point of teaching spatial and urban planning, again, I continued with the deficit model with all the theories and orientations and with all the frameworks and the analytical frameworks of what is considered to be ideal for the city and what may not considered to be ideal for the city. Now, with that long journey that I have summarized, I also went through and experienced uh, through observation, a lot of things that were not working the way that the teaching and the training that I got was telling me. Prices or charges for water connectivity were increasing. The charges for water services was increasing. The less and less people were connected to sewage uh, services or sewage network within the city. A lot of people were working in informal settlements, yet yes, in the training, we were told when you have a land use plan, and I trained the students about this, you have to kind of separate land uses, commercial from residential and industrial, and then you have to consider commuting distance and time between residential to industrial with an underlying assumption that once you plan for industry, seamlessly industries will come and establish in cities, and seamlessly the labor will also fill up the positions of employment within those industries. There was a disjuncture, there is still as much disjuncture today as there was before when I was a, a, a student and trainee and an academic in starting to venture into this urban planning field. And because of that, I was inspired to undertake urban research to see what actually can be worked on and what could be uh, the solution or the different pathways that could enable transformation of urban areas within Uganda and Global South in general. And I came across, I had so many trainings, but along the way, uh, I, I found myself with a new terminology in terms of met methodology that was co-producing knowledge. And then I realized that actually, when I was introduced to that terminology, I had already practiced co-producing of knowledge, partly as participatory research in urban places, and that co-producing of knowledge implied co-design, of the studies, co-generation of knowledge with the people that you are actually purported to be studying or helping, helping in quote unquote and capital letters and underlined. I don't think that it is that much help. Co-implementation with multiple stakeholders and co-management of the knowledge, which could be partly dissemination, but also documentation, packaging that knowledge in a way that can inform others and inspire others in many fields. And, and, and along, alongside that co-producing knowledge, I realized that there were very fundamental disjunctures in terms of equity within the city. I realized that there were the, the, the deficit model had a blind spot for opportunities. I realized that the deficit model also had another blind spot of what there is in, as opposed to what is missing in terms of creativity, ingenuity, and harnessing of resources in informal settlements and cities as a large. And I also realized that around opportunities and informal settlements, there is innovation, but that innovation could be disruptive. And that's when I started engaging or getting on the borders with the political economy debate and the politics and policy, because the moment you innovate, 
you disrupt the establishment. And when you disrupt the establishment, there's always going to be resistance. So whatever comes from the bottom in communities in cities is considered to be noise and disruptive. And whatever comes from the municipal authority and management authority of cities is what should be adhered to with the use of regulation and laws, the planning ordinances, the structure planning provisions and all the laws that we, as we know them, the Public Health Act, the standards around infrastructure, and there's always continuous tension between the what is happening in local communities within cities as opposed to what is happening in the decision making arena where you have the politicians and technical people who decide how the city should be organized, the order in it, the functionality in it, and who should be part of it. Although this is never mentioned directly, my assessment in case that the planning domain as it is with these colonial legacies is very much sitting in the space where it, it ex excludes many people, not directly, but it is never mentioned. And there's no, almost no effort to actually be inclusive, despite the fact that most planning and most public spending on infrastructure is done in the interest of the public. Again, quote unquote, in capital letters and very much underlined at the same time bold. So that means that there is a lot that is going on in terms of ingenuities in local communities. And when we co-produced, I have multiple examples I can give, but I can speak about one of the projects which I undertook on realizing that there's a mismatch between the labor market, urban labor market, and the life skills of majority people in communities. We actually wanted, we started a research initiative, co-produced learning from previous others studies that were funded by external funding agencies to co-produce knowledge around how can people become integrated into the urban economy. And, 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 and that economy should not only be centered around industry and service. There are other possibilities. If you look at what there is in, in terms of resources and kind of put a blind eye or blind spot on um, kind of freeze the deficit, what there is, then you can actually try to develop, co-generate and co-implement different business models that would integrate as pathways many people into the urban economy. So we worked around waste recycling we, with energy briquettes. We've worked around sanitation. We've worked around uh, urban and peri-urban agriculture. And there are lots of possible enterprises using the business model that integrates people into the urban economy through each of these strands, urban agriculture, sanitation, at the same time also waste recycling, but also waste reuse or simply waste resale. And along the way, we have learned a lot of things which now strikes the point of research that matters, that there is a lot of possible opportunities in urban Africa, largely, but also in informal settlements, there are a lot of resources, there's a lot of creativity and ingenuity by individuals and households, women-led, youth-led, there are so many groups that have emerged around many things, including these three strands that I've mentioned, but they are not part of the mainstream academy or science, they are neither part of that much the mainstream public policy and public expenditure in many of the cities. And, and that means that we can think about cities differently in Africa. They have definitely developed in a different way. The trajectory differs completely from the trajectory of cities in the global north. And the, the, the notions of order, the notions of space, the notion of functionality of cities are very much contested in urban Africa. And the notion of standards is the one which for me strikes the most. Whereas you think about a certain minimum number of square meters for an individual in other cities in like in the global north, in urban Africa, 20 square meters can actually accommodate as many as 15 people. And you won't hear that much complaint about it. And they will live in these informal settlements or they will live in this type of housing. They will develop careers from those type of housing. They will be industrious as we have seen in many different aspects within the cities and they will continue in their lifetime. Some of them do actually uh, move one step above in the social class 
and they can move to other neighborhoods, but majority of them actually stay within this kind of, because of the limitations around or limited, limitations driven by the life skills. I have learned that we can look at what there is in, in urban Africa and tinker urban Africa to bring decency to urban Africa, to bring, um, to, to, to step up the innovation, to integrate many people into the urban economy. And that's where we worked on energy markets, working with youth and women led groups. We have worked with them, co-trained from product development to product marketing, to business development and sales and record keeping. And they have now moved a step further. They are training other groups in other different settlements where we are not working because we can only work in a particular settlement as a lab. You can, many people call them living labs. We call it an urban action lab. And along that journey, we brought policymakers at local level, the sub municipality and even municipality. We engaged them. They were part of the discussions. They were part of the trainings. They were part of the validations and testing of the technologies for energy brigade. We moved from hand manual machine to fabricate machine, energy brigades to electrified machine to fabricate. We discussed and went through the process and pathways for increasing production. We discussed and went through pass pathways to market and, and, and work around the uptake of energy briquettes because the dominant energy within the city is wood, wood fuel and charcoal and, and a little bit gas and electricity. So this new product, you will have to do a lot. You will have to do a lot of promotion. You will have to do demonstrations. They have participated in exhibitions. They have participated internationally, but also nationally. And, and in that process, a new kind of labor force is starting to emerge. And we're hoping that this peer-to-peer -peer learning where they are training, there are other people who, um, in other settlements can then spar or be a spiral for innovation to disrupt the, the, main, the establishment of urban management in Africa, but also to tinker urban Africa in space. Now you can realize that talking about sanitation waste and urban and peri-urban agriculture means that you have to freeze land use planning, you have to freeze land use zoning almost. You also have to almost freeze development control. Why? Because if you bring these ones that I've mentioned as being frozen now, it means that the disruption won't occur. What is happening is that there is a bit of transformation being, um, you know, starting where the municipal authority There's a bit of uh, movement starting where the information is starting to get into the policy and policy actors, mayors and technical people are starting to appreciate some innovation around community contracting, some innovation around institutionalization of energy briquettes, which means that research that matters is starting to uh, catalyze transformation in urban Africa. So I would like to, to stop here for the moment and turn, turn it back to you quickly, but that is the journey. And those are the examples of what I think of as research that matters, where the actors are multiple, the municipalities and governance is transforming, the locals are leading, and there is decency that is starting to emerge in some places of urban Africa. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm, I'm sure if if I didn't introduce you as the academic person in the room, everyone would think you are coming from the community because your examples are very much on point in terms of reflecting a lot of the community experience. Um, I have so much to ask. I have a lot of questions. I've learned so much from you um, with just this brief presentation. With regards, I mean, my major takeaway is the co-generation of business models in, in African spaces where we have a continent with a, an average age of 19 years. So you have quite a vibrant city yet. Um, there's a lot of mismatch in terms of how this energy can actually be put to good economic um, use. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite an interesting outlook you've given. I think I'll give you a bit more time later to take us a bit more into uh, and give us the details of it because I am I mean as 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 a practitioner myself I'm pretty much keen on 
knowing how to take this journey forward and scale it up. Because um, traveling across the continent is quite evident with the post-pandemic, there's quite a lot of economic hardship out there. And the key part and the one other component I, I took from your presentation was the fact that it is it is informal, but doesn't mean that there's no opportunities in there. It is informal, doesn't mean that there's no creativity in there. It is informal, doesn't mean that there's no agencies in there. It is informal, doesn't mean they don't have the agency to actually take situations um, um, into their own hands and transform their own circumstances. So um, thank you so much for the presentation. I mean, I still want to listen more to you, but I will give um, Dr. Beth um, the opportunity to also um, give us her reflection from a more community point of view. I, I, this is all about community conversation, I believe. <laughs> so Beth. Uh, uh, thank you, Kweku. Um, as you do, I scanned over who is in this room and I saw Celine, uh, who just happens to be one of the midwives of this process and uh, someone that I learned a lot from. So it's uh, a bit daunting to be talking about SDI's processes in, uh, when we in the room when there's um, someone who taught me most of what I know. But let's see, Celine, you can you can gauge how good you were in uh, bringing a, a new generation of... Uh, go, Beth, go. You're great. <laughs> Do it. Um, the way I wanted to look at this was uh, sort of like I look at the trajectory of how SDI has uh, used knowledge. Um, it's the different points um, is uh, our network has grown. I will refer a lot to Zimbabwe because that's the context that I'm most familiar with because I'm Zimbabwean obviously and most of my work was with uh, the Zimbabwe SCI affiliate. In the early years, we were supported by uh, the federations that were, was growing in South Africa and one of the distinct messages that they brought to us was that uh, Power is knowledge and money. In uh, Zulu, they say Amandla um, Imali And that was very intricately linked to the tools that SDI was using to mobilize communities. So community grounded women led saving collectives, as well as beginning to create a knowledge hub within communities. And uh, what this did first and foremost is to give a sense of pride and oneness in communities that were almost always disenfranchised and uh, unconnected because the urban existence for most people who are new immigrants in the city is that they don't know their neighbor, they don't work with their neighbor. So the saving schemes did that. And they did more importantly for women, um, giving them voice within their households, but also within their communities. And then the second issue was around collecting uh, data and knowledge, knowledge about how the settlement itself started, why it started, who started it what kind of services are available, what is lacking, what can the community do on its own and what does it require duty bearers, be they uh, local councillors or the city to support them with. And this began to create um, a repository of knowledge within these communities. So communities, could, for instance, go to a local authority and say, we settled here because we have reached from this particular settlement. While we've been here, so many, the population of the settlement has grown to this much. We have this many toilets, we have no water points or we have this many water points. We have, amongst ourselves, created so many 
saving schemes and this is how much we have saved. What we require from you is secure tenure and improvement in our services, but we're not asking you just to improve the services. We can contribute so much to developing our settlement and this is really powerful. So the, for, for us in Zimbabwe, this was the first interaction that we had with developing community knowledge. I'm not saying, or collecting community knowledge because community knowledge has always been there. Just no one had ever had uh, actually the, the sense to bring this together. And especially for people living outside of the margins of the formal city. We, we had a variety of uh, experiences depending on the local authority. Some mistrusted this information that was being collected by uneducated people. Other local authorities saw this as uh, an opportunity. I remember recounting an example in one settlement called Angamvra in Mutari, where in our wisdom, we thought if we could quantify the amount that Beki at dwellers were paying to their landlords. We could go to the local authority and say, look just how much is in this community and this money is going to the landlords. It could come to you as the city if you could just give these people security of tenure. But of course, the reaction from the local authority was, wow, there's this much money, let's uh, levy a charge on every landlord that is a backyard shack. And of course, you know who ended up paying more, the, the uh, backyard shack dwellers. As STI grew, we began to see an opportunity and interest um, in linking with others. And uh, first and foremost, because we, 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 we had a lot of issues with local authorities that did not trust our, 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 our information. So we began to link with academia to come to add value occasionally even in a very pragmatic way just to give their, their voices to, to this information that was being collected. But we also began to see a shift within some local authorities who were actually saying, look, we know nothing about these settlements because we don't have a process that can actually address this. So we are very keen to partner with you to start to identify and understand these settlements. And in a lot of cases, some local authorities began to also partner in developing tools that could collect information that they could actually also use in their own programming. Uh, so you started to see research teams within certain cities, planners within certain cities who were willing to to partner with uh, SCI affiliates. We, and as the network grew, we began to link to other agencies, especially those that represent local authorities. And one such agency is actually UCLGA, who around 2011, thereabouts, we started, we challenged, we actually was, met with mayors as they do in Senegal. Uh, in Dakar, and we were saying to them, you don't know your settlements. Uh, there is an argument as to who coined this phrase. We think we did, but if you ask uh, Jean-Pierre Elombasi, who, uh, the Secretary General of UCLGA, you say it was, his, uh, it was him. But we said we will develop a know your city process where essentially we will challenge local authorities to work with us to know their cities. And uh, collectively with support from the Santa Fe Institute, uh, we developed a tool that all affiliates of SDI and other uh, communities that were interested could begin to start to collect data that they could use locally to, for advocacy, but that we also could develop into a repository that could could um, start to compare uh, the development of uh, slums and informal settlements across a variety of cities. We had a challenge, I think it was, uh, if I know, I'm not mistaken, 2014 thereabouts, 
to have um, profiled a hundred cities and we exceeded that. So this process is continued to go, grow. They are, we, we, we and, and, and expand into other areas. We collecting for, at the moment, because SDI affiliates are collecting, are mapping risk related to flooding or fires that are linked to the increasing uh, climate emergency. They are developing uh, plans to address this and um, challenging local authorities to put resources into uh, these processes. Uh, SDI affiliates over the COVID pandemic use their data to negotiate with um, um, governments or charitable organizations to begin to give grants to informal settlements dwellers. I, I think for those that I, across the globe, different governments did different things. If you are a slum dweller and you are in the informal sector, no one recognizes you as vulnerable. So to use our information to say we can we can tell you who lives in Madari in, in Nairobi, uh, what what the structure of their families and where exactly they are, and you, you can use that information as a basis to 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 include them in a grant that will uh, mitigate against the the challenges that COVID. Uh, brought in um, the our affiliate here in South Africa with other social uh, civil society organizations began a process that they were calling as which in uh, which means let's fight for each other. Where essentially they use the data they collected to say to government this settlement is at risk because there are no water points, there are no toilets. If we want to address these issues and ensure that people are protected against COVID, we need to address that. Um, we worked with uh, the World Bank to map what they were calling hotspots using the methods that SDI has developed and perfected uh, over time. We, we, I guess for, for us, knowledge, is about uptake and I'm, I'm, I'm defining uptake as the process necessary in order to create action. Because it will not help a community if, if uh, a local authority says, yes, we agree there are no toilets in this particular settlement. That's not uptake. Uptake is, yes, we agree. And this is the plan that we are putting in place to address that particular issue. These are the resources that we as a local authority are putting onto the table. And this is what we think, and we want to work with you as a, as a, as a community to deliver, to deliver this. We working with um, a number of academic institutions, local authorities, research institutions, because we, we understand that there is value in the core creation of knowledge and that if we don't put our stamp to the knowledge that is being delivered by academia, it will continue to be um, an, an anchor in people's lived experiences and the value of the knowledge that communities generate on their own is the fact that it is real, it is truth, and it can ultimately, hopefully, support mobilization for people to, to, to actually to, to, to act. We, we, we really want and seek partners, but we seek partners in the sense that they first and foremost come with an understanding that there is knowledge that is often untapped and undesired in some respects, and that this is actually a resource that can be used 
to further developing and addressing the challenges that uh, our cities our cities face um, I'm quite optimistic because I think there is definitely a seismic change in what is considered as knowledge. The battle is not yet won, but there definitely is um, a growing a, a growing group of people who understand the value of this knowledge and who also understand and are skeptical about what has been used as necessary data or knowledge to develop our cities. There's the education I got over a four-year uh, bachelor's degree in planning. Perhaps it taught me to think, but if I look back, my university have been the years that I've spent with SDI and we, uh, those of us who are in, in uh, this cohort of activists that uh, have spent time with SDI are very committed to also developing a, a group or a cadre of activists and planners who understand this logic where they are pro what they are proposing is necessary for African cities is informed by what our cities actually look like and not what we think they should look like. Um, I'm very happy to talk until the cows come home, uh, but um, those, were, those are just my, my initial reflections, Kweku, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I was so keen on the Kindles. I've forgotten I'm actually the moderator for the session. But I mean, <laughs> the, 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 the most exciting point is the standardization of models that have actually um, predicated or being used as, as, as a measure for designing um, urban spaces in um, African cities. I think um, Frank Fernand said that if we want to develop urban cities, to look like Europe, though if you bring Europeans to come and stay in African cities and not the other way around. Um, and for that reason, we should have our own development that looks like us. And one of the conversations that has been going on on decolonizing um, um, the urban debate and urban discussion and research, I know it's a huge topic, um, but again, the conversation still besides the research besides crafting of the various approaches, we're also looking at um, urban reform and how should urban reform reflect some of, how can some of these research approaches that we are um, building um, inform uh, urban, um, urban reform? I mean, that's a conversation to be had on another day. But I would, I would, I would be glad if, um, Shwaib, you can, there's a comment in the, comment box that says, okay, it's great to hear, okay, let me go straight to the point. Um, I mean, I think the reference is towards the end of your submission, establishment is, uh, political establishment is starting to appreciate research, which the person actually acknowledged. Um, Bully Lani, I think I got the name right. Um, I acknowledge that, yes, but it was also capping the conversation around politicians having a politi particular political tenure. And for that reason, if we anchor our research within those particular spaces, within the tension and the clash, wouldn't that undermine sometimes the progress that we make within our urban research? Um, how would you respond to that? I'm not sure I captured everything clearly, but yeah. I, 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 I also read it. So, mm. yes, thank you very much, Bulelani, for that observation. Very true. We have to be very careful mm. about these small moments of celebration. I call them celebratory events of successes, mm. because that is also pretty much similar to the story in the development world, especially with the civil society organizations 20, 30 years ago. And, and, and the progression to covering everyone is less seen and more challenging at the moment. Yes, the priorities of politicians change. However, 
to, to, to be on the kind of optimistic side a little bit because this is truly transformational and cityscapes are you know geographical entities whether you think of jurisdiction or other city regions where you can actually attract kind of investment to tinker urban the work of the academics straddling these spaces is not stopping there so we don't stop at the point where we see these celebratory events the small ones and say yeah we are successful there is no success here the the just like the thinking about you know, you know, deconstructing urban in terms of class slum clearance, cities without slum has stalled. Perhaps it will even never be rejuvenated again. The the progression in terms of growth of settlements that with challenging issues. I don't want to call them slums. I don't want to call them informal areas, because there's demonstration that it is possible for these areas to be transformed. That work will continue. That is why we're investing a lot in younger talks in the academy, training younger people and, and attracting them or advising them to join institutions like SDI. In SDI Kampala, I think about almost a quarter or even between a quarter and a half of the staff in SDI were my students or our students from the department in urban and regional planning. So this kind of new human resource needed in cities. Who is going to plan the cities in Africa? The kind of planner who is able to negotiate, who is a broker uh, and appreciates the knowledge, like Beth said, not stopping at recognizing what they are, what is missing, but what there is and developing a plan about the possibilities identified from research and the possibilities identified from the ongoing individual ingenuity. Yes, you are absolutely right. So we are very much aware about this. And uh, the intention here was not to project these small celebratory moments as the end of the process of urban tinkering and bringing, bringing decency to urban Africa. Yeah. Back to you, Kweku. Thank you so much. Um, um, but would you want to add something to that particular um, question, if you have your thoughts? Um, uh, how you've anchored your programs on um, polit the political tension and the political pushbacks you've had with regards to your SDR work. I know with SDR there's a lot of activism and mobilization and, and, and fighting for, for rights and spaces. Um, um, how do you anchor some of your work with political, I don't know whether it's political institutions or politicians. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so politics yeah. can either be a, 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 um, an impediment or an opportunity. Um, I always tell people uh, being Zimbabwean, the, the SDI affiliate in Zimbabwe made most of its progress during the, the Zimbabwean crisis. If the local authorities had money, <laughs> they had uh, the political rule from gov central government, they would not be as listening to alternatives and, and uh, new ways of doing things as they were because they were in a, in a fix for want of a better word. So, so political upheaval can actually be an opportunity in, in some respects, but also, we communities invest in creating a, the politicians they, they, they want, but also informing them and ensuring that they are involved at the local, at the local level. But having said that, politics is politics. Um, over the last 10 years in the city I, I was, uh, I grew up in Harare, there have been, I don't know how many changes of mayors. And this has an impact on progress because you invest so much in, in moving forward with uh, a political leader and then they are fired or they are changed and you have to kind of like go back to the drawing board. But communities sign, for the, sign up for this because they understand that this is not an easy, this isn't easy, this is not an easy process, change is difficult. And uh, these, these are issues that they, they, they understand. A, a big part also is fighting for institutionalization of change. 
So if you, the South African affiliate of SDA will tell you actually that the first housing uh, policy in South Africa was uh, developed on the basis of suggestions they actually made. Uh, the Namibian uh, affiliate of SDA will tell you that the flexible land tenure that currently is, um, is now in Namibia, they made a contribution to the development of that. The Zimbabwean affiliate is mentioned by name in the housing policy in Zimbabwe. So institutionalizing processes is not, is absolutely critical. Um, uh, Schwab's um, colleagues at, in, uh, in the SDI affiliate work closely with government around the programs and in, in stop government's interaction with communities because they have had a long history of working together. So creating those, those, um, those alliances is important. Of course, it is also risky because the, you, can, you can be co-opted or you can be seen as co-opted. Yeah. So there's always also, it's always critical for you to demonstrate that you have a certain level of independence. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Schwab will be leaving us. So I want him to give us a very short uh, response to uh, how are funding institutions kind of waking up to this kind of new approach to research. Um, I believe I have personally worked on a few projects that I realized that it's kind of a very innovative uh, approach now emerging with regards to how funders are now looking at how research can be modeled. And some mm -hmm. of these are trying to ensure inclusivity um, equity um, and, and all that, and not necessarily giving a very tight um, theme um, for researchers, theme that makes it difficult for researchers to navigate their way around. Um, so in terms of looking at the landscape, is it changing? Has it always stayed like that? I think you are much more of a seasoned researcher, so you understand um, what is happening with regards to the research landscape. Yeah, please. Yeah, thanks once again. Oh, okay. Um, again, we, we have to step back and think about the funding agencies. They are the, the, the what I think of as the mainstream funding agencies. There's little transformation and change among us those. So, I mean, FCDO, that category, but they're also emerging brokers of uh, research funding that are Af African based who tap into those big envelopes and then bring it there is much more appreciation and uptake on the side of Africa-based research funding agencies, mm -hmm. um, brokers, if you will, to actually embrace the kind of research that matters and the kind of research that we have been doing and the transdisciplinary research, which is again, something that we have for long been actually doing, but is now being framed as a specialist research approach for which we need training and capacity building. Anyway, so you are familiar with the, the leading integrated research in Africa, which was focused yeah. on cities. This is the model that we think can, uh, has provided some insights on how in African-based institutions can tap into the mainstream funding agencies and then adapt and, if you will, decolonize the, 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 the model, the, the models operandi around funding research and even conducting research in Africa. So some slight changes happening, but not very big steps because the dominance of funding still comes from the mainstream and the agenda, even when it is slightly informed by the kind of research we're doing, SDI and others, the agenda is still very much shaped in the way that, oh, there is help that is needed in Africa. So that saviorism is still very much latent into the funding model uh, for the case of Africa. And the saviorism always focuses on large scale infrastructure, housing, urban governance, municipal taxation, and, 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 and improvement of tax collection in cities. What is the proportion of number of people collect from which the cities collect uh, taxes? Perhaps you know, in some cities, not less than, not more than 15%. So why continue with that model when actually the other 75 or 60% can be integrated using different pathways? Which pathways I identified the kind of research model like LIRA? Back to you. And I would really, really would like to apologize because I have to jump into another meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for the time. And I really appreciate your time. Uh, any questions that directed to you, I will make sure I forward it to you by email. 
and I know you had a very tight time spot and uh, thank you so much for making time to be part of this exciting conversation. I think the hot seat is not going to be on bed, so most of them out of time, so you don't have to worry so much. <laughs> All right, bye. Prof. Bye, bye. Thank you. Apologies, everyone. Enjoy your day. Yes. <laughs> Um, so there's a question that was actually posed, but um, directed at you, where, how does uptake of local knowledge differ depending on the size of local authority? Um, so the example the person was giving was the city of Cape Town, uh, Nairobi, they are actually huge cities. So how do you influence um, 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 city policy with local knowledge? I... I, I think that, that's a very interesting question. I, so I think cities have a shape and history. <laughs> I think where, where the issues are very contested, it's very difficult to, to make change. Um, my experience is that uh, local, smaller local authorities are easier to influence than, than big local authorities. If you, because mm -hmm. the issues we're dealing with are, issues to do with land, housing, uh, access to services, and they, those are always very contested in, in larger cities. But the SDI affiliate in, in, in Nairobi has actually made like some really interesting um, inroads in, in uh, getting a new law uh, gazetted around special planning areas. But they, they didn't go and say, we want to do this across all the informal settlements in, in, in Nairobi. They targeted one and developed a prototype that they can now say can be uh, replicated elsewhere. So I, I, would, I would agree that um, the larger cities are a, a lot more difficult uh, to, to influence. Having said that, uh, the SDI affiliate in, in Cape Town actually works, collects most of the informal settlements data that the city of Cape Town uses. So there is, there is that as well. Um, yeah, so it, it varies really, but I would agree that smaller local authorities are probably a lot more receptive. <laughs> Sounds good. So, I mean, local. So it's better to actually target local, smaller local authorities than the larger ones, because I guess the larger ones, are, they have larger problems to deal with in comparison to actually the local city authorities. Um, all right, so I'm just going to open the um, question um, session. So if anyone has any questions to actually post, um, you can directly ask me um, or we can, you can ask Beth and maybe I can give you my take. Um, if the question is directed at Prof. Um, Schweib, I can also take note of that and we can communicate that detail to you. But um, there's a reference that Prof. Um, Schweib made with regards to the leading integrated research agenda um, by the International Science Council, um, which is a program that seems to be a bit um, transdisciplinary, proactive with regards to framing and thinking about research differently. There's also another research program that is actually ongoing called the African Cities Research Consortium, um, which is also framed differently. That also looks at um, 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 uh, ensuring uptake becomes an integrated part of um, the whole entire research process. So these are all kind of emerging um, um, new um, funding programs on urban development in Africa that are rethinking and reliving and relooking at um, 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 urban research and sustainable research differently and trying to capture some of these issues that we have been dealing with um, over the years. Um, the links are in the, um, um, the links are in the chat box and you can follow up um, and read on them later. Uh, but in the meantime, most of these resources are going to be made available here. If you have any questions, um, I would always want to share with you. But, but before I proceed, can you just share with me before we get any questions or hands up in the group. Can you just uh, uh, educate us? What do you think uh, with the ACRC program being part of the team, um, what, what kind of novelty do you find from that particular research project? Okay. Um, I'm, everyone, I'm a, is everyone aware of what ACRC is? It's, 
so this, this, yeah, this uh, Ikeley and ourselves are, are consortium partners of this uh, large research program in 13 African cities that's being coordinated by the University of Manchester. Um, I think there is an opportunity in like, I think the last uh, comment that Troy made around and learning structures that exist. My, my experience is that there is really serious good intentions within ACRC to really uh, ground local knowledge in the research. So for those of us that are part of the process, it is also incumbent upon us to take that opportunity and run with it and uh, be uh, constructively critical where it's not working as SDI in the eight cities that um, ACR, SDI is the eight African cities where ACRC is working, where SDI has a presence. We, we are taking responsibility for participating in some of those research. And um, some of the pressure actually is on our, from ourselves because we're not natural academics. We're not academics. And in being around a cohort of academics put pressure on. So is our paper really up to standard? But we actually kept talking to each other and telling uh, each other that we have every right to be here with a, a perspective to bring to this process. And perhaps it's time for the natural academics to also feel a bit nervous about the kind of information that they bring to communities. But for me personally, I feel it is an opportunity. Um, there is still a lot that is difficult and needs to change. And I, I might also want to add, and I've said this over and over again, it's not just about global North academics, it's also about global South academics because you are cut from the same cloth and oftentimes the experience of communities in dealing with academics is the same. Um, their knowledge is not valued, their time sometimes is not valued, they are not given the right of reply where perhaps critical points are made. So even global so South academics also have to unlearn some practices that are embedded in this industry called academic research. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think there's something that I can also add to this. Uh, it's, it's about the various layers of knowledge and the various layers of expectations when working within the urban space. Um, community knowledge and community practice knowledge or, uh, and, and, and policy knowledge and, and academic knowledge or scientific knowledge are totally different sets of knowledge. And we all use different languages and different discourse. We frame things differently and we see things differently. Um, and I believe that as we uh, begin to negotiate how we can work better together, as various entities. It's also important for us to also understand that we are all not at the same knowledge level and we should be able to step and learn, relearn and find ways of connecting that works best for each one of us. And that is also kind of connected, it's linked to a paper we published, I think in 2021, called uh, the power dynamics in transdisciplinary research for sustainable urban transition and what that is doing is to flatten the power dynamics because academics hold some level of power policymakers hold some level of power but the question is what kind of power does communities also do hold so again as beth you indicated and uh, the way we package knowledge um, from the various even though we want to encourage collaboration Often the way we package it, it's a quite naive. I mean, I can admit to that particular experience myself. 
um, being a PhD student, student going into an informal community with a baseline study. I mean, it was so naive of me thinking that I'm going to get any proper feedback, but unfortunately, um, I, I was advised not to because uh, having a pen and a paper in an informal settlement, you look like a government official and the next moment you'll be, you be kicked out. So it's all the processes that I learned by my engagement and that actually helped in terms of understanding the kind of language and engagement we should use when we're actually engaging with various stakeholders who are not within from, who are not within our practice. And, and, and moving forward, we begin to unlearn some of our ways and sometimes the terms and even the language that is used. I mean, you're going to study a community and you're calling them poor household I, and, and, and informal. And who uses such, and sometimes it's because it's negative to the environment. And that means, and you are using such terms to actually still seek collaboration from them. So even from the wedding and, and engagement, we often um, over, we, we make mistakes in those particular process. So it's important for us to actually understand and, 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 and connect with entities that have lived experience in such communities so that we can actually build a very good entry um, relationships before we embed our research in such communities uh, to be able to get the kind of impact we are looking for. So this is a little bit of my thoughts about the subject. There's quite a lot to unpack um, personally, but I think we are almost running out of time. I will not be able to answer all the questions um, in the group, but I'll capture them and we will respond to them by email as much as possible. Those ones that are directed at Beth, I will send it to her. And those ones that are directed at Prof, I will also direct it to her. Um, come again. Yes, yeah, so I'm actually, we're actually uh, conducting a poll to um, so give us a feedback on your impression of um, what, how the session went. Um, your response um, would be highly appreciated. Um, it's just a, a two minutes click here and there, and you can um, just send in your response and we should be done. Um, but I'm actually super excited and grateful for staying through the entire session uh, um, for almost about one and a half hours. Um, participating in all the sessions. Those who sent their questions and I'm, I'm not able to respond, uh, please accept my apology. Um, we will be moving forward with this discussion in subsequent webinars. So please be looking out for weekly webinars, um, Rise Africa events um, for research activities and research uptake uh, coming and imagine from the consortium of research activities that we are doing in African cities. So please um, fill in your polls at the moment um, and we will be wrapping up in the next few minutes um, to enable the next session to actually go through. But before we do that, if you still have any questions you want to pose, if you have any comments you want to ask, the mic is now open. Please feel free. It's, uh, we are celebrating urban legends in this particular research space. So feel free to share your thoughts. Feel free to give us your feedback. Feel free to give us your opinions. And we want to actually make sure that we can actually structure this particular activity and interactions more um, productively, and make more productive use of your time as we proceed. So the microphone is open. The floor is open now. Share your thoughts and your comments. Um, I don't know. Should I call Selena? <laughs> Should I call Selena to add her voice to? <laughs> well, thank you, Kweku. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to add a dimension that is very central to SDI, which is building local leadership of slum dwellers. And whether it is savings or whether it is collecting information or whether it is, uh, uh, you know, dealing with your own community issues of somebody's husband is beating the woman or, you know, there's no money to cook food the next day. From small issues to big issues of infrastructure, the main essence of this process is being to build leadership of, especially of women who can not only solve their day-to-day -day problems, 
but are able to keep moving to the next level. So you're building capacity to talk to local government, you're building capacity to talk to other actors in your community, to politicians, to your national government, to funders, to... So, so there's a lot of capacity building in the research process and it's not just about making, you know, collecting data. It's more than that. And I think that quality of that data collection becomes very special because the women shine. It's like polishing a diamond. Each time you do something new, you discover your own capacity. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. I can actually look for a better conclusion than uh, the more you shine, the more you identify your own capacity to actually do more, to actually uplift yourself in any situation or challenge that you find yourself. I'm super grateful for your inputs. Um, the microphone is still open. Please volunteer, share your thoughts um, as we actually conclude today's session. We have any more? Okay. All right, so without much ado, thank you, Beth. Um, thank you, Prof. Um, Prof, um, there's a last poll coming through. Please make sure you just tick which areas of research uptake would you recommend for future discussions? Um, we'll be very excited to actually have your opinion in there. Currently, as we are looking at polls, most people are pretty much excited about practice. They want to see more evidence in terms of practice, and we look forward to actually encouraging you. But in the meantime, I would want to thank Pro Professor Schweib. Um, I would also want to thank Beth. Um, if you have your last words, you can actually say it um, before we draw the curtains to a close of this session. Beth. Yeah, just to say thank you. Um, I, 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 I enjoyed myself, and uh, yeah. Thank you, Quinko. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, my today's start, what I'm so happy about is the fact that we didn't use a PowerPoint and it was a genuine, sincere conversation um, of, of people who care about the city, people who think that there's a lot of opportunity and creativity within the city. There are, it's a conversation about people who think that there's an agency within the city and there's an agency for us to actually act now uh, the kind of energy we have, we should be able to catalyze any kind of research opportunities that are emerging to be able to advance what urban research means um, for Africa. And without much ado, thank you so much and have a lovely evening. Bye. Bye.